ES Audio. Hello, this is the Evening Standard Theatre Podcast. I'm Nick Curtis. I'm Nancy Durrant. And I'm Nick Clark. Here's what's coming up on this week's show. We'll be reviewing Operation Mincemeat. That's on at the Fortune Theatre. And Susie Izzard, also known as Eddie Izzard, joins us to talk about her new show, Great Expectations. I realised that singers, in my stand-up, I play multiple characters. I could use this multiple characters talking to each other technique, which not everyone does in stand-up. In fact, most people don't seem to do in stand-up. But I do, and I thought, well, I can use that for drama. Plus, for our second review, it's August in England at the Bush Theatre. It wasn't long after that when Dad went. In the last week he was alive, I saw him every day. He just wanted to talk and talk and talk. He said, when I first come to England, it was like white people would just ignore me in the street. That's a play written and performed by Seleni Henry. This is your go-to theatre guide of what to see or not to see in London right now. So welcome to this week's episode of the Evening Standard Theatre Podcast. We're back in our studio this week with news that Cush Jumbo <gasps> is going to join David Tennant in the Donmar Warehouse's Macbeth, which we talked about last week because we we're did. very excited. What yeah. a great bit of casting. I know. Terrific. Yeah, having seen her Hamlet yes. oh, yeah. a couple of years back at the Young Vic and also having seen her host the Evening Standard Theatre Awards sublimely well oh, a so few good. years back. She was great fun. Uh, she's a wonderful person, Cush Jumbo. I've interviewed mm. her in the past and she's such a sort of ball of fire and such a talented performer, I think. An already exciting Macbeth just got really much, much yeah. more exciting. Yeah, Absolutely. It's true. The most recent impressive one that I saw was Saoirse Ronan at the Almeida. Um, yeah, she was great. She was great. Played it with her own Irish accent amidst all these sort of growling Scottish hulking men. <laughs> um, and she was this sort of tiny blonde figure in the middle of it. And it just made her stand out like a sort of beacon. In yeah, the she felt sort of luminous. Luminous is the word I would put to it, yeah. I saw Harriet Walter uh, play it opposite Anthony Sher in a, in a production that was played straight through some years back and that was sort of quite macabre and sinister. Mm. It's always interesting where you cast the ages of the Macbeths mm. as well isn't mm. it? That, well, uh, the Patrick Stewart and Kate Fleetwood one. Yes, I mean that case in point. That puts where he was a much older Macbeth and yep. it, it puts the sort of his ambition in a different light. Mm. It also puts their childlessness yeah. uh, into a different context depending on if they're an older or a younger mm. couple. But also her ambition as well, you yeah. know, a younger woman being a bit more kind of, you know, hungry for power without really necessarily having such a full understanding of what the consequences might be. Yeah. And yeah. of course, before she was the Queen, Claire Foy, with yes. Lady Macbeth. Yes. Yeah. Indeed. With James McAvoy. James wasn't McAvoy, it? that's right. I think that was one of the first times I'd seen her on stage, and she was terrific. Mm. Yeah, in that. fantastic. I'd love to see uh, Rosalie Craig play Macbeth. I think she was a, an excellent Lady Macduff uh, in yes. the one that Kenneth Branner did, which again we talked about last week mm. at the Manchester International Festival. Mm. She, for me, was the standout in that show. I think she'd make a really great. Lady Casting directors take note. Well, the other news this week: there's a flat for rent uh, during the Edinburgh Festival for thirty-four thousand pounds for the month. For the month, yeah. I mean, wow. That's a lot. It's a a three. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, you're having a laugh. You you are having a laugh. That's insane. It's called profiteering. It is called profiteering. I mean, I think it's been known that the economics of the Edinburgh Festival, particularly the Fringe, are somewhat have been somewhat screwed for a number of years. They are a mess. You know, the the rental fees for for venues and for accommodation, uh, the way that time slots have been pared down. I feel really sad about this. I loved going to the uh, Edinburgh Festival. I used to cover it, and it was just so, it was so great. Just you find so many brilliant things, but. Uh, this is just such sad news. And of course, the other thing I should say is that I met my wife in uh, at, the Ed- at the Edinburgh Festival. So you do not need to go back. So I do, really. Well, let's yeah. hope it holds out because uh, I can't afford to go back for a second time. <laughs> Stick with him, Mrs. Clark. Stick with him. <laughs> should we kick off with our uh, first review? Yeah, let's. let's it's it. a good week this week, isn't it? It really is. What this country needs is a genius plan. What this country needs is a genius man. For some were born to follow the Lord. So, Operation Mincemeat. This is, I think I described it the first time I reviewed it, as the little show that could. Um, It's been around for five years, started out at the new diorama, went to Southwark Playhouse, went to Riverside Studios, went back to Southwark Playhouse, which is the first time I saw it, and now it's in the utterly gorgeous Fortune Theatre. So nice. Mm. Isn't it? It's glorious. It's a a deco theatre. It's about 400 seats or something, 400 seats, one of the tiny ones. And I think... 
Operation Mincemeat might well be the one that replaces The Woman in Black, which ran for so many years at the Fortune Theatre and, and, and may well run and run. I mean, I sort of sincerely hope it does. And we should tell people what it's about. This yes. is an unlikely musical based on an unlikely wartime plot where a bunch of basically posh blokes in the security services during the war cooked up this scheme that they would plant false plans about the liberation of Europe on a dead body, wash it ashore, hope it'll be picked up by the Nazis, get to Hitler, and that he would then pull all his troops out of Sicily. Out of Sicily, Sicily, yes. And leave the way open to the Allied Allied invasion. Absolutely mad plan. Yeah. And it works. And it works. (laughs) Spoiler alert, but I mean, you know, the story's out there. It's not an untold story because it it is one that Ben McIntyre covered in his book of the same name. Several books before that as well and actually and, it, yeah. and The Man Who Never Was is based on this which story, was written that by film, which one of the guys who actually who is the leading agent in that this comes plot, into really. it yeah. but they, they found it through a podcast surprisingly right um, well I think is what they told oh, us oh our guys yeah it, yeah, yeah. It, it, it spit lip but when they created the musical they found it from listening to a podcast but also, there's a very different adaptation of this story that came out two years ago, again called Operation Mincemeat, but which was turned into a film with yes. Colin Firth, uh, yeah. Jason Isaacs, and, and Matthew McFadden, and it's a very serious take on this story. This could not be more different. This is so but it, amazingly, it keeps the spirit of it, yep. yes. but makes it very silly, very funny, amazing, all sorts of genres of music, yeah. and just somehow it all just works. All singing, all dancing, cabaret style. Yeah. Not very much, uh, you know, hardly any set to speak of in it. Mm. Lots of some costume changes. There is a. A sort of a dance routine for a Nazi boy band at one point, where it <laughs> opens the second half. That, that moment yeah. is absolutely extraordinary. When it's this sort of all red and black lighting, and you can't really see what is going on, and there's this little formation, and then it slowly dawns on you. Yes. <laughs> yeah. All in full. And, and it's sort of German electro. Like, oh. Yes, exactly. Yes, yeah, it's sort of Euro pop. Joking. Yeah. Yeah. And it could be awful. I mean, that, that's a real gamble to do yeah. stuff like this. And I think this show is full of of gambles, which amazingly come off again, like the wartime plot. If you wrote this down on paper, you'd just think that's the maddest idea. It's got an entirely loose attitude to uh, gender. There's lots of women playing men, men playing women. And I think um, that actually is part of is part of it, isn't it? You can get away with an awful lot when you yeah. do that because everything is is a piss take up yes. to a point. You know, everything is sent up always with affection, but mm. absolutely everything, absolutely every stereotype. Like the you know the the typing pool girls mm. who appear once, they all kind of come in like this, all siggies and yeah. head wraps and and then do and a sort like, of Beyonce and number, then do don't an they? Absolute, just, <laughs> so so good. Yes, um, but you know if it wasn't sort of gender and utterly gender blind cast mm, yeah. then you kind of, that would be slightly dodgerama but yes. it's not it's just it works in some ways it feels sort of invidious to pick out individual people in this but I think we yeah. do have to mention Natasha Hodgson who plays Ewan Montague who She's is so the sort good. of brash swaggering gruff you know yeah. utterly utterly self confident sort of public yeah. school self mythologising yeah. yeah. you know I, I, well as the first song says some were born to follow but we were born to we lead, born yeah. to lead. Yeah. and I've Absolutely got to tell you it. it really sets the stall out for the show that song They've just released the cast recording. I listened to it, which was a mistake because I have that song lodged in my head <laughs> and it will not leave. It's brilliant, but yeah. it won't leave my head. There's a rather beautiful sea shanty about halfway through, mm. which I was sort of singing in the shower mm. about two days ago and it was I just sort of popped into my head. And actually, yeah. I think Felix Hagen is behind the music. Yes, yes. And, um, he's the non-performing one of the Yes, creators. exactly. Yes. And it really is brilliant. It's its own thing, but there's a lot of pastiche in there as well, just for fun. There's also this great kind of variety mm. and a great variety in tone as well because it's yeah. mo- I mean, all right it's mostly extremely silly and very very funny yes and then every now and again there's a number and a moment that absolutely punches the you other, in the gut the other person i wanted to pick out was jack malone who oh, plays totally hester agree. leggett who yeah. is totally a sort agree. of spinster figure isn't she yeah and, and one of those sort of you know stoical backroom types mm. you know yeah. of, of sort of long-suffering uh, self-deprecating women who do you know made it all happen during the war but she gets a wonderful hester gets a wonderful so song moving. really yeah moving. dear bill it's um, old, it's beautiful. And so something that could be a bit of a, you know, sort of draggy, jokey thing is actually really, really effective. There that, were a, that a lot moment. of sniffles. Oh my God. When that at that finished. song, dist- I saw me. it the first time at, I think it was the, Me- was it at the Menier? No, it was the Southwark Playhouse. Southern Southern Playhouse. Was, yes. That was it. Uh, around the corner and then this time and both times it absolutely destroyed me and, and that's yeah. a huge testament to, to Jack Malone I think because yeah. of all the transformations his ones are extraordinary it, with Hester it just takes a little 
sort of attitude shift, a lift of yeah. the chin. Mm. I mean, he's got those glasses that are amazing, oh, glasses, sort of typing pool glasses. Yes. But his performance is that, and then the submarine commander yeah. to uh, the doctor who sources the body. Oh, my God. It could not be more different. Spillsbury. I mean, uh, Spillsbury, who is a sort of like MC figure from yeah. Cabaret, or a bit like yes. Sweeney Todd. Yes. Absolutely. So but those awful. three, all of them transform, but I think his transformations oh. are just uh, extraordinary. Yeah, yes. they're incredible. So the West End, it has been very gently... Uh, upgraded by the director uh, Rob Robert Hasty. Hasty yes. yeah. He's the artistic director of Sheffield Theatres and he was behind uh, Standing at the Sky's Edge at the National mm. recently. And I think he's done an amazing job. He's kept the sort of like slightly shonky is perhaps not the word but the sort of slightly rough and ready aspect yeah. of it it's which a slight it, feeling of let's do the show right here thing, yeah exactly just, he's you know, managed to yes. keep that in but he's also uh, clearly the costumes are a huge improvement so Spillsbury's apron particularly is a, is a definite <laughs> yeah, like, yes. notch up with its yes. kind of glitter blood splatters yes. it's absolutely brilliant and also the backdrop the, the set has obviously had a bit of money spent on it as well the um, final which number. You, well the final <laughs> yes. number but also the Nazi boy band number, that, you know, when <laughs> yeah. when all the elect- sort of lights and stuff were, were happening, I, I leaned to my friend. I was like, "That's where the million quid went." Yeah. So, yes. you know, For a fairly simple backdrop, it's actually very clever. There's quite a lot of wartime maps on it. Aren't yeah, there? it does a lot. It. it does a lot. It works it very hard. A, a fairly simple set. Yeah, and he's also got the five performers who were the ones who originated it. Um, he's got them up a level as well because the first time I saw it, I really enjoyed it, but I missed quite a bit of the. Uh, of the lyrics mm. and stuff because it's so fast and it was being swallowed a little bit. Yes. I took a friend of mine who was initially a bit dubious. He was saying, you know, lots of people died in this invasion. Mm. Is it really right that you do a jokey musical about this? And also, all contemporary versions of the story, I think, have to pay homage to the homeless Welshman whose body was used. Yes, um, Glyndwr Michael. Glyndwr Michael, mm. which this show does extremely well. Yes, and very beautifully, actually. the invasion did actually, as they point out, save countless lives on both sides. Yeah. You know, the Allied and Axis troops yeah. fewer were killed than would have been but killed. But it's interesting, yeah, isn't it? Because it is, it's a silly knockabout show, but it has extraordinary heart and extraordinary depth that takes you by complete surprise. Yeah. Mm. And it absolutely doesn't take it lightly that... The, the deaths mm. and actually that is personified by how they treat Glindo and Michael yes. I think at the end it, there's a sort of moment of quiet away from the, the songs and the, and all of that there's a moment of quiet and tribute to him mm. it's and very fact, moving and actually. during the submarine scene as well mm. the submarine captain who is this sort of figure who seems to understand the importance of what's going on when no one else when everyone's living in a fantasy land playing dress up going around nightclubs to create the mm. fictional yeah. trail of, of this yes. hero they've made up but the, the the submarine captain sort of understands and says thank you for your service, yeah. mm. and that was a very moving moment. And then to the end, when all the cast members sort of gather around, they do it absolutely beautifully. So I hope your friend was sort of he sated. Was, in he the, was in one the, over by the yeah. Yes, yes, yes. He absolutely was. It was a pleasure to see this again. Uh, mm. You know, seeing it at Southwark was great, but it's it's quite nice seeing it in a theatre that is close to the period that it addresses. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's true. Yeah. So it's lovely seeing this little jewel of a show in this little jewel of a theatre, and I we, we wish it well. Yeah, I, I think have been recommended to absolutely yeah. every. Me too. <laughs> yes. Go and get a ticket. Well, hopefully it will run and run. I don't know if if, yeah. if it will extend, but if it doesn't, quick. Yeah. Also, <laughs> go. Yeah. Get also, a I mean, check them out on social media. Their yeah. social media game for this show is absolutely on point. And you can hear our interview with Natasha Hodgson and David Cumming, who plays Charles Chumley in Operation Mincemeat, by clicking the link in our show notes. It's time for a quick break, but coming up, we have Eddie Izzard, aka Susie Izzard, from Riverside Studios in Hammersmith. I'm Tim Minchin, I'm the composer-lyricist of Groundhog Day the Musical, and you are listening to the Evening Standard Theatre Podcast. I'm uh, here at Riverside Studios with Eddie Azard, or Susie Azard, as she is sometimes known now. As anyone can choose, yes, to, to make everyone happy so they don't need to write in on a postcard and say, what's going on? Prefer she, her, don't mind he, him, prefer Susie, him, don't mind Eddie. I'm gender fluid, I've been out for 38 years, so everyone should be used to this by now. But the, 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 yes, the, the pronoun thing is a slight ad- adjustment. Okay. But no one can make a mistake with me. Right. And my brother's sticking with Eddie, my director, Selena Cadell, is sticking with Eddie, my older brother, Mark, sticking with Eddie, so... Uh, it's it's all groovy. Okay. It's, unless you call me Arthur or Sabrina or... I won't call you any of those. Or, yeah. We've met a few times over the years, but this time we are talking about a new venture. Yes. Your 
first Dickensian stage show. Great expectations. Yes, first of nine that I'm going to do. Well, you <laughs> could do the complete could. works. Well, you could. well, there is it in my head because it started from the fact that I'm 150 years to the day younger than Dickens. I yes. just n- knew this. I found this out when I was younger. 7th of February, 1812, 7th of February, 1962. What does it mean? Nothing in particular. But then I realized I'd never worked, read a great work of literature and so I thought, well, I've got this Dickens link. Why don't I ask if anyone out there would like a, me to do an audio book? And uh, a company called Wildfire, they, they said, yes, we will commission you to go for, and they chose uh, Great Expectations. They chose it. Oh, they chose it, not as you. They chose it, because it could have been anywhere. I suppose Oliver was one I had a more of a link to. My brother was saying Pickwick Papers, yeah. uh, which was still really interesting in my head, because I don't know that so well. But I'd never read a, a work of literature because I'm dyslexic, yes. severely atypically dyslexic. But I thought this would push me to read a book because, you know, they say, well, we've commissioned you, you've signed a contract. As I was doing, or even before I was doing it, I realised that singers, in my stand-up, I play multiple characters, a technique I got from Richard Pryor. Mm. I could use this multiple characters talking to each other technique, which not everyone does in stand-up. In fact, most people don't seem to do in stand-up, but I do. And I thought, well, I can use that for drama as well as for stand-up. And yeah. I said in my head, why don't I do this to a dramatic version of uh, Great Expectations. I said to my older brother, Mark, why don't we work on this together? We'll cut it down. He just did it himself while I was touring. So I mm. said, fine, Mark, if you do it, because it's great. Had you, you worked together before, you and Mark? Had he done stuff for you before? He had done all the translations and helped with all the translations on, in French, German, and Spanish, right. as he is pretty fluent in all those. And he worked with other translators to make sure that the the language was good for me. He insists on saying that he didn't translate them all because he's very particular like that, but he, he he is just better than I am in the languages. Right. Um, so we'd already worked together, and it's tricky working with family. It sometimes can go wrong, but he's done a great job on Great Expectations. Cut it down for 20 hours to just over two hours. Well, it's, actually, it's, about, it's just under two hours now. And about the same length as the film, the great, the benchmark film. And uh, we took it to, to New York first off Broadway. And yes, got, why New York first? Well, yeah. it was it was partly because New York knew me and, and London knew me as well, so I could go either place. It was available there. I just thought, well, let's try it in New York. Does it carry less baggage over there? I mean, I think because Great Expectations, it has great name recognition, but it also is rather freighted. You know, there's been that other new version. Has what, the TV over, version. over here, you mean? Yes. Well, I, it wasn't more like that. Maybe they would give me slightly more space. I'm, I'm known as, as comedy and drama, slightly stronger in America. In Britain, there's still, oh, you're a comedian. Have you done anything drama? Well, I've done 25 years of films up to yeah. Victoria and Abdul, and I was Tony nominated on Broadway. Oh, really? We didn't notice any of this. So <laughs> yes. there's been a sort of uh, a non-viewing of that. And, uh, you know, my comedy is really interesting, but my drama has now got really interesting. I think my comedy, my drama started very weak. Right. Uh, and I know why, and I can tell you why. Why? Uh, because... I had the presence of mind, as a, f- a lover of films who broke into Pinewood Studios when I was 15, like Spielberg did to Universal when mm. he was 17. Different careers, but still the idea Same trying to get in the film. Arc, yes. Same basic trying to get in there. Mine was a slower takeoff. Um, I realized that it's about being rather than acting, rather than pushing. But also there's a thing I feel that bottom line of comedy is to be funny and the bottom line of drama is to be truthful. And if you go from comedy into drama, you have developed comedy muscles. These muscles get in the way when you're trying to be truthful and live in a scene as a, as a character. Uh, so I switched all my comedy muscles off. I dialed them all down to zero on the control desk in my mind. And then I realized I had no instincts because mm. I hadn't developed the dramatic instincts. So my early work in films is... V- from where it's pretty not good or basic or nothing really is happening there. I remember in the past that you were saying I was a bit shit in that, but next time I'll be slightly less shit. I'm yes, and I, <laughs> and there was this thing in my in the documentary Believe saying, well, why do you want to be a so-so actor when you're a brilliant comedian? It's because I used to be a so-so comedian. I'm I'm so-so at everything, as probably most people are. Most people start pretty uh, ish, and then you ah okay, well, you're getting something there, yeah. and then it takes off. And now I think my drama is getting well. The rave reviews, the best reviews I've had in my life. Mm. New York. It's yeah. um, 45 pull quotes. In The Guardian, they said, I went on about it three times about my reviews because <laughs> they're, they're great and I need to be my own self-publicist because uh, otherwise you get lost in a big maelstrom of everything else going yes. on. Yes, sure. You're also rehearsing your one-woman Hamlet at the yes. same time as doing Dickens. Now, as they did in the great days of repertory. Yeah, well, I don't think they did them one woman at the time, did they? But <laughs> like no, in the great days of repertory. But doesn't, I don't know if, the, if you'd asked all the actors, would they be okay on doing a one-person show? Mm. Um 
maybe maybe they wouldn't be so cool on it. But I'm I'm perfectly suited to do the one person show because yeah. they won't give me a Hamlet. You know, right. no one's putting uh, Eddie Izzard, Susie Izzard, whoever they call themselves. Mm. Shall we put them at the top of our list? The next person to ask to do Hamlet, I don't think so. So. I thought, let's go in. And we're doing open rehearsals as well, which will happen throughout this year and in and around Britain. And um, it's an intriguing thing. People, if they, if they saw it, they seem to be positive about what I could do yeah. with Hamlet. Because you're playing Hamlet and Ophelia and mm. Gertrude and Polonius. And you're taking the whole thing apart. And the history. I love the history of Shakespeare. Why did he not write Hamlet down? Why is it the first quarter and then the second quarter and then the folio 20 years later? Why is the first quarter lost until the 1800s? Yeah. And then they find it out. And if you look at the To Be speech, it's, it's completely, well, it's, it's about half half or maybe it's the quarter 25 percent the same that's intriguing why didn't he write it down if it's the big deal hmm. when when shakespeare died why was there not a big song and dance if he's the greatest bard that was ever happening hmm. uh, he just died in in stratford and no one gave him monkeys yeah whereas i think ben johnson and all the other guys they got sort of you know a bit of pomp and ceremony going on yeah it's curious intriguing hmm. and he was a, he must have been a catholic his dad was a catholic his sister was catholic they were all you know it was all the time of the catholic process yeah, 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 yeah. was he gay marlowe was out why wasn't he out hmm. i find all that interesting anyway yeah. so just taking that apart and then dickens is there on on this other track that's all that's, that, that's I'm just getting it back to life now having done nine weeks we went to do six weeks in New York and it extended to nine weeks before we even opened mm. and then the reviewers just went you know performance of the year and prepare to be transfixed and I yeah thought, holy cow I did, wasn't going to read them wasn't supposed to read them and I thought these are too good I have to read them I see so. you said that these were these were perfect shows for you why do you why do you say that well because I'm a stand-up because yeah. I've, I've done 35 years of stand-up I have had so much time, and I was a street performer before yes, that. Yeah. If you think about, particularly in Shakespeare, they were doing it off the back of cards. They were strolling players. Yeah. And if you think about why were they strolling players? Because the Greeks and the Romans had theatres. Hmm. How do we go from theatres and then a thousand years of no theatres? I think it's Christianity must have got in the way. But they said, if you're going to perform, it's got to be about Christianity, and it's going to be the end. You can't do any of this. It was Christianity, stuff. and it was royalty, wasn't it? It was something about royalty licensing the theatres, I believe. And, but but and also the Lord but, Chamberlain's men and the but, but there were no but there were no theatres. Before mm. they, not yeah. only licensing of theatres, there was no one you're in right, the building. You're right. Yes, and then they yes. had the curtain theatre because they pulled a curtain across it. So anyway, I find all that fascinating. Yeah. And as someone who was a street performer for four years, I was doing performing like they used to. And so when you get to the soliloquies, and this is again going Hamlet here, as my director Selena Cattell was saying, you are perfectly suited. I am perfectly suited to do soliloquies because I've been doing hours by now years of stand-up yeah. up to the Hollywood Bowl in Madison Square Garden mm. talking to people in this direct way and then playing the characters which I got from Richard Bright it's, yes. it's an interesting mm. journey it's, it's just curious journey and I'm coming to Shakespeare it must be in a different way to the way most people is yeah so had you always had you harboured a desire to play the Dane as they say in With Nell and I was this you know the sort of classic particularly I'm thinking from a comedy background to want to as is that someone, the ultimate as someone who felt that I as I felt I had something interesting to bring to drama and it's now my, as my roles are getting better and better Victoria and Abdul the people I know have seen me playing Edward the Seventh in that against Judy Dench and going Oh, that was you. Hmm. Oh. And they just didn't know that I was there. I am very ready to do this. So I haven't desperately pushed for Richard III, actually, slightly more than Hamlet. Ah, yeah. But when I'm playing Hamlet, the weird thing is I feel very at home. Yeah. And I said to Ian McKellen, is, you know, I'm 61, is this a bit old to play? This is before he did his. Is this a bit old to play Hamlet? He said, no, 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 do it any age you want. Oh, all right, Ian. Yeah. And then he went and did his at 80. Well, they're he must going, have, they're must going have been already in his head. They're going both ways. We've realised that uh, Ken Branner is about to play Lear and he's about your age. I think he's 62, 63. Right, so right, he's right. a very young Lear. And, well, and yes. Maybe I, a slightly older I Hamlet. think do what the hell you. 21st century rules, yeah? yeah. Just go for it. If you, if you look at the 21st century, you can see politically, human politically, a lot of people, the vast majority of the world are going positive. Man, live and let live. Women mm. should be able to do this. Men do this. LGBTQ, whatever you want. Be positive. Go for your dreams. And then there's a few, there's about 10 to 15 people who are saying, no, pull it back. Back to the tw 1930s. Come on, let's try lying as a whole th a business. You know, Boris Johnson, Donald Trump, just lie upon, lie upon. I'll say one lie ahead of the, of the pack. And you're going, what is that? you're bringing to the table that's useless stuff so it's almost like we're splitting apart mm. but i think the ma vast majority of us are trying to go forward into a live and let live world yeah without wishing to sound clear but does being gender fluid um in any way inform the fact that you're playing male and female characters i, in this, in I both really hope so one of the reviews said that I, i'm playing the male and the female characters with equal I, i'm paraphrasing it but equal honor mm. 
Hopefully, yeah. uh, my, my Estella and Miss Havisham, I play the Estella and Miss Havisham within me, and then I'm playing the Pip within me and the Joe Gargi within me, and Mrs. Joe, um, another female character. Mm. Just, just try and live and be them. And when I was younger, I couldn't have done that, especially with all the I'm trans and I'm not telling anyone I'm trans. Yes. And now that I've been out for so long, almost 40 years, I just, come on, let's just, just live as those people and see what happens on stage. Yeah. Is this a new phase, effectively? I mean, I, was, I remember being very aware that, you know, you'd, as you said, you had this hugely successful stand-up career, and then I remember you saying you wanted to be in the biggest playground, you wanted to be in America, where films were made, where television was made, yep. and you wanted to sort of crack that. This seems like, you're, feels like almost in your 60s you're moving into, is, is this a different phase? No. The, the stage no, I, phase? I don't no. think it, it might look like it, but I just decided, let's do an audiobook, and then, oh, I can yeah. do a thing off that, and oh, that's really working, oh, I've got Ray reviews oh I want to do Hamlet let's do the same thing as that I'm literally floating with what's happening next mm. when good film roles come up I go for that doing this in theatre does mean that I can do it when I want I just want to say let's I mean I've done uh, if I take great expectations I've done it in the back garden of my makeup artist Rachel in in LA so that my lighting designer Tyler and Alec, he could see it. I've done it by my old school, in the dell of my old school in Eastbourne, um, where I did a performance of the Tuma Nycomy, which is what uh, Shakespeare, a Latin play that Shakespeare based the comedy of errors on. Mm. And I did that version in Latin there. So I've just, I've just done it all around the place, in big rooms and small rooms, in previews. And then we launched it in, in New York. So I'm, I literally, um, I plan ahead, I strategize in how to drive things, but this has just opened up and so I'm going with it. Yeah. Where are you based these days? Are you in, in the UK? Or uh, yes, UK and, Amer and America, but it's whenever I'm, if I'm filming, it's wherever I'm filming. If I'm touring, it's wherever I'm touring. If I'm doing um, uh, Great Expectations, it's wherever I'm performing that. Or if I'm an activist in politics, it's wherever I'm campaigning. And I'm quite happy. I don't mind. I, I like having a base, but I'm not nailed to a base. Some people need, this is my roots, I'm here yes. and I'm lost. Yes. I'm an adventurer. Hmm. I'm an adventurer. Like really, if they say, right, you're going to Ulaanbaatar and you're going to do a, a, a thing there and they're going, okay, let's go. Yeah. I wonder how that'll be. One thing I suppose I did want to ask you is where your drive comes from. I mean, not just the, you know, going from stand-up to acting to movies to, to now now theatre and one-woman shows of these of these vast literary and, and theatrical classics, but also the marathons, of course, you know, running a mad amount of marathons in a mad number of days. And gigs in French, German and Spanish And gigs in French, well. German and Spanish. And I mean, I, I seem to remember uh, in the past you told me you wanted to do a gig in the language of the, of the place where you were born, which was Yemen. Uh, yeah, no, I'd love to do uh, Arabic. The Arabic's after Spanish. Mm. I think I have the determination gene, maybe. I, th I don't think that's anything to pat myself on the back for. I think that's there. But I would say that I have worked on that intrinsic thing that I've got inside me, and I've really worked it. And I, initially I pushed, because I dropped out of uni at 19, right. and I took off at 30. So there was 11 years there of really trying and not getting anywhere. And when it did unlock, and the, the secret to the unlocking was I stopped trying to get somewhere fast. Mm. I tried to get somewhere, not as fast as possible, but as good as possible. And I just stopped work. I said, forget about the speed, just, just work on the stuff. And when it's good enough, people will come. Yeah. And that field of dreams type idea. And when that started taking off in the stand-up, and I applied that into the drama, and I applied it into marathon running or gigs in French, German, and Spanish, whatever it is, I just try and work it, work it, work it until it gets good. So it's like I've unlocked something that is a potential there. And you have one life. We know we have one life. Other people say multiple lives, whatever, but we, no one's proved that. We know we got this one. Yeah. So one life, live it well. Absolutely. Well, Eddie Azad, Susie Azad, thank you very much for speaking to me. Thank you very much. And you can read my extended interview in the Evening Standard newspaper or online next week. Coming up after the break, we'll be reviewing August in England at the Bush Theatre, starring Lenny Henry. And this would be the perfect opportunity to give our podcast a five-star rating and hit subscribe. We'll see you back here in just a minute. Hi, I'm Marisha Wallace, and you're listening to the Evening Standard Theatre Podcast. Welcome back. Now it's time for our second review. It's August in England at the Bush Theatre. Uh, Nancy, what's the play about? So it's inspired very much by the Windrush scandal. It's Lenny Henry's first stage play that he's written. He's written plays before, but only for radio. And it's about a man named August Henderson who comes over from Jamaica on his mother's passport to Britain during the 50s and comes to London and then ends up moving uh, quite early on to the black country. Uh, he lives a perfectly normal life, full of incident, as all of our lives are, really, but only of ordinary kinds. And then towards uh, the end of it, he has the rug pulled out from under his feet when letters start arriving, saying things like, you are not 
permitted to stay in this country. You know, living a long period in Britain does not confer citizenship. And he doesn't know where his papers are. He don't, I don't even think he's got a passport. No. He's terrified by it. And uh, when in our interview with Lenny and Lynette, they were talking quite a lot about those letters and about the language of those letters and how completely uncommunicative they were, but also absolutely terrifying, especially for people who just haven't thought about this stuff because they've literally been here like, you know, 50 years. Yes. And, you know, were just sort of dragged here by their parents and then did become citizens. So it takes you all the way through his life in England, everything that happens, what happens with his wife, what happens with his children, his veg shop, you know, all of that kind of stuff. And then what happens in the end, which is really frightening, yeah. actually. It's really affecting. Don't you I think, think it's, it's hitting a real moment, you know, it's, yeah. it's, it's perfectly timed. Because well, I, I was going to ask, so it clearly draws on a huge and terrible news story and yeah. something that's very present currently, and we're coming up to Windrush Day yeah. uh, yes. next month, but does it hang together as a, as a, as a dramatic work? Yeah, yeah, and also as a comedy, it has to be yeah. said, that for all it that, that it is an affecting story, it's very funny. I think it's safe to say that um, Lenny is leaning into his comedy past, and as yeah. well as his own family history. So he, he's got this wonderful accent as August, which is half Caribbean, half black country. Isn't yeah. it? So, and he has a lot of sort of banter with the audience as well. There's a lot of, of sort of call and response stuff almost. Um, yeah, he's a supremely confident comedian. You yeah. kind of forget, actually, that because he's been doing so much other stuff in recent years, you sort of forget that he's, a, he's an incredibly accomplished stand-up. And this he is, does yes, definitely yeah. lean on that. He plays the audience like, and, you know, he's very funny. And, and, and I think it's recognisably his voice in the jokes as well, don't you? Yes. There's a lot of like, oh, such and such liketh something you know like a, a, and that, yes, yeah, and it's, that's very very him yes yeah yeah no I totally agree it is a combination of the superlative stand-up that he was and possibly still is um, and this very serious stage actor he has reinvented himself as mm. uh, at a relatively late stage in life I think some of the reviews of this have been a little bit generous you know mm. I think it, it's not pushing many boundaries really um, not theatrically no, no I don't think so it's I not that sophisticated I don't think no I, I mean to be honest with you I sort of feel like most of the reviews that I've read are of the play that you will see if you go and see it now now that he's got into the swing of it I yeah. imagine it's sort of flows slightly better yes um because i felt on press night that he was you know you could see he was someone who hadn't done a monologue of 90 minutes yes you know all on his own before and there was a, there were a few little stumbles and that uh, you, you know that's fine i mean you can only be, yeah. that can only be expected but i think now you'll see something really quite a lot more polished i think you will but i mean as, as you said nancy a lot of the some of the punchlines are, are sort of a bit you know you can see them coming down a mile off um yeah. some of the emotional stuff is a little bit mawkish as well uh the, the stuff about the family relationships and particularly his relationship with his wife but that said i, I do just think this is tapping into a righteous outrage and anger about this situation that's yeah. out there it's perfectly located at the bush you know the bush is, is the, the best best place for it yeah. um, it's very well co-directed by Lynette Linton and Daniel Bailey I think it gets rather better in its second half I mean it is it's 90 minutes straight through you don't have an interval but um, it sort of really picks up because the first part is very much him telling the story of his life essentially yeah. um, and so you really really need to be able to carry the sort of relatable minutiae of a you know a man who starts running a fruit and veg shop in order for that to work but I think it's sort of it starts to gather pace and the story is absolutely bloody enraging mm, you know yeah. it's, it's it's awful and you see at the end um and I kind of see why they did this, although you don't necessarily need it. You see several people's, uh, real people's testimonies on film at the end. Yes. Um, he sort of comes off stage and sits actually in the audience mm. and watches them with you. And they're really upsetting, you know, just these just these normal people who've worked for the NHS or worked in their local council. And then one day are kind of told, oh, uh we just need to check that you've actually got the right to work here. You know, so 15 years down the line or something. And it's absolute. it's so... It's so upsetting. It's, I mean, it's outrageous. Yes. It genuinely is. I'm going to pick a couple of little holes in it. I thought it felt long, actually, at 90 minutes. I thought it could have been a tight 70 to 80, which is uh, perhaps on, you know, not what you would expect from this show. And also, you know, I do think that he's made something a bit bigger than it needs to be because of the pressure of being you know, Lenny Henry doing yeah. a show about Windrush, essentially. Like, no shade. This is an elevated monologue delivered by a knight of the realm. Yeah. And the extra bits, like there are sort of CCTV moments where you, where you see him, which kind of foreshadow what happens later, mm. 
you don't need them. You don't need them at all because no. the weight is in the subject. It doesn't need to be in the execution. It's a normal, relatably madcap life. Mm. And it's that that makes it tragic. And that's the, what makes the gut punch yes. land. You don't need to signpost them with anything else. Yeah. So I don't, I don't think those are necessarily a, a useful addition. No. And I think they slightly complicate the production hmm. but in itself because i read it before i saw it right and so none of that was in there and actually i felt like it flowed really well yeah it's interesting this is the second play in a year we've seen about the windrush sh- scandal there was on the ropes at the park theater the story of vernon van Riel, the black british boxer yeah. who yeah. was you know pretty much a champion and then you know was suddenly expelled and and left in jamaica in this limbo because he wasn't a jamaican citizen either um and so was basically living on the streets august in england is a vastly superior work to that i have to say but i think again to address that it's it's touching a moment i think the fact that we've had these two stories urgently delivered to our stages so soon after the windrush scandal uh kicked off really a couple of years back is a is a, a, a signifier of, of yeah. the anger that's, that's out there. It's so People have connected. It's sold out, you know, pretty yeah, quickly. It and is. It, it's sold out. You know, it's a testament to that anger, but also uh, to wh- how people view Lenny Henry as well. Yeah, yeah. And the fact that he's done it, I think, is 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 really important. I agree. I totally agree. I mean, he is. It's an overworked phrase, national treasure, but he is a national treasure. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah I, I mean, I've, you I've know, if there was a if there was a so box of people, yeah. you know, actual national, then he's he's definitely him and Judy Dench. Yes, exactly. You just can't. I mean, yeah, yeah. I mean, he's he's just possibly Hannah Waddingham. Yes. Now. Yeah. Oh yes, oh, yes. Now. Hannah Waddingham. Let's hear it for musical theatre. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's on until June the tenth at the Bush Theatre. I mean, it's basically sold out, but you know, you never know with returns. And fingers crossed, it'll get another life. This has been the Evening Standard Theatre podcast. You can find all our reviews and news online at standard.co.uk and all our other episodes wherever you get your podcasts. And a reminder that my extended interview with Eddie Izzard, a.k.a. Susie Izzard, will be in the paper and online this week. You can also find both our interviews with the team behind Operation Mincemeat and Sir Lenny Henry and Lynette Linton for August in England in our show notes. Don't forget to subscribe so you never miss an episode. We'll see you next week. Music